You are listening to Exploring Sacred with your host, Denise Iwana Francisco, on the Temple Within Radio and Digital Media Network, giving voice to the sacred. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to a beautiful brand new day. And uh, it's Wednesday. It's Exploring Sacred. And here in the United States, we are creeping up on a holiday known as Memorial Day. And for some of us, for some of us who grew up in military households, for me, my father was a career military man. And for others, you know, maybe you've grown up in a household where you were for a very brief time, the son or the daughter of a military man or a woman called off to combat. Maybe you're an adult child of the experience of being a child of a war veteran. Whatever your reason is for tuning in this morning, welcome to the show. I've opened up the chat room, so please do feel free to join in on the conversation. Because this show is a conversation starter, and for anybody who knows me, uh, I've often been told that I'm a conversation starter, and I like that. I like to talk about things sometimes that aren't welcome at the dinner table at family gatherings. You know what I'm talking about, those things where if you begin to talk about it or even think about it, the eyeballs either begin to roll or the look of hush yourself comes across the table or across the living room. And so we're going to talk about one of those things today. And perhaps it wasn't something in your household that wasn't talked about openly. Or maybe now you're finally ready to talk about it. So let's talk about it. Being the child of combat, what does that mean? Well, what it means to me is being in a household where one, maybe both of your parents have gone off to war. For me, as an army brat, and I call myself that uh, in a good way, I am a military brat. As I said, I grew up in a military family, and it is the crux of my remembrances from my childhood, Memorial Day, Veterans Day, my father being stationed at the Pentagon. He worked for the Army Joint Chiefs of Staff. And I remember on those days making it to the National Cemetery, standing at the perpetual flame of the unknown soldier, the flame of Robert Kennedy, And I remember standing there, just me and my dad, watching the changing of the guard. And if you've never seen such a thing at our nation's capital, it is, for me anyway, I will say breathtaking. Oftentimes, our holidays become a source of activities that not only honor the purpose of the holiday, but also an excuse or a reason to party or come together. And we may lose the impetus for the reason that we've gathered or the reason that we're taking flowers to, for the, you know, to the cemetery. And today I'd like to talk about something that's another layer to Memorial Day. <clears throat> it struck me as the history nerd that I am. I call myself that. I am somebody who has always studied history, even though I didn't know my own personal history as an adopted child, but I love history. And looking at the history of Memorial Day, a day that originally, from my understanding, was dedicated to those soldiers who fought in the Confederate Army and the Union Army during the American Civil War. In my family of origin, I have grandfathers who fought in the Confederate Army. I don't have any grandfathers that fought in the Union Army. I have grandfathers that fought in the Revolutionary War. I have fathers that have fought in Vietnam, Korea, World War I, World War II, Cambodia. The list goes on and on. And not all of them died in combat. Not all of them died in combat, but my experience as the daughter of a career military man is that even though perhaps my father did not lay his body down, 
Thank you, Crosby, Stills, Nash, and Young, right, for that song. I still can't even listen to that song without crying. If it comes on, I have to turn the station. But I think to myself, <clears throat> perhaps not everybody's body was left in a field or in a sunken ship. I now have a granddaughter who's stationed at Pearl Harbor there in Honolulu. Not everybody's buddy's body may have been left behind, but what was left behind is a chunk of their soul, of their spirit, maybe of their joy, of their innocence, of their mental and emotional health and well-being. Some give all and some give nearly all. Some give nearly all and come back to try to put the pieces together. Some come back without all of their pieces, men and women come back without all of their pieces. And this is not a show about feeling sorry or pity. It's not that at all. A warrior is a warrior. And the warriors in my family go back to the war at Glencoe in Scotland, Clan MacDonald. My lineage goes back to the warriors here in Native America, what we might call south of the Mason-Dixon. My people from Georgia come from the Cherokee and the Seminole persuasion those clans, those lineages. I come from a long line of warriors. There is no pity, but there is a realization with my age that there's far more that happens after the ticker tape parade. If you had one when you came home, as the daughter of two Vietnam veterans, I know for a fact that neither my biological father or my adoptive father came back to ticker tape. In fact, they came back to being spit upon. They came back to not even being allowed to be a member of the VFW, the Veterans of Foreign War. The first time my dad, the Sarge, told me that, I said, what do you mean, Dad? You're a combat soldier in Vietnam. And he said, but it's considered a conflict, honey. It's not considered a war. Therefore, I am not eligible to be a member of a VFW. I almost fainted, and I was young. A conflict, a conflict that cost tens of thousands of American lives. Hmm. I've never walked into a VFW since. I guess maybe that's my army brat, right? Bullheadedness. So my dad helped to create a beautiful, uh, what do I want to call that? What is it? They're in Apple Valley, Minnesota. Not the VFW, but the other one, right? Somebody help me out there. I've just lost the words. What I'm trying to say is that not all is always lost, and God bless those on either side of war that have left their bodies behind, that laid them down. But those that come back, I believe very rarely, American Legion, that's the word I'm looking for, American Legion Post, Apple Valley, Minnesota, my father is one of the founding members. All right, so if you go there, daddy -o is listed on the founding member roster. Recently, in my own clientele, there's been a theme. Good morning, Katie Battle. Good morning. There's been a theme. And that theme that I've noticed and I've shared with my husband, Todd, are the number of clients who are coming to me for mentoring or what have you just want to talk about the fact that they are daughters of Vietnam veterans. They're daughters of Vietnam veterans. And now in their late 40s, early 50s, having an opportunity to take a look back on their lives and taking a look back on the recent, perhaps, passing of their father or the impending passing of their father who served in Vietnam. And really diving into the fact that the father that went to Vietnam and the father who came back from Vietnam, and I think this applies to all combat, was not the same man. And I could be wrong about that. I can only talk about my experience. And there's a tricky part to all of this, in my mind. I've been doing a lot of studying with a dear friend of mine, Terry Ruel, who is a magnificent psychotherapist. I've been taking some classes with her and learning a lot about what it is that we as children hold on to and doesn't always mature at the same rate that our body does. 
Sometimes our psyche is lagging behind the old aging process of the body. And one thing that I noticed in conversations with all of these beautiful women is that in some cases their memories or the way that they're trying to process how their father changed is being done by the, the six-year-old on the inside. It's being done by the five-year-old on the inside, the one who bore witness to the person who came back and the one who bore witness to the way mom and dad's marriage either continued or didn't continue. The one who bore witness to a dad who was once happy-go-lucky maybe came back needing to mask it, to make it go away temporarily in the bottle or with pills or a various other array of ways that we can numb ourselves. I mean, let's face it, years ago, and I think even to today, the subject of death can really be quite taboo, at least here in the United States. And warriors are looked at as warriors, and there was a time that maybe you got a report over the radio, right? World War I, World War II. Maybe you got a little snippet over the radio. Nowadays, we see it on the big screen. We see it in our living rooms. And I believe depending on when a trauma happened in our lives, whether you're a young husband or a young wife whose spouse has gone off to war, I think sometimes we tend to stay stuck at that age trying to process what it was that the trauma brought to us that still lives within us. And for children, that interior castle that each of us has will have a room for me, it was the age of six. I remember vividly my dad coming home from Vietnam and going to Gerald R. Ford International Airport. That's what it's called now. Back then it was Kent County Airport. I remember that day like it was yesterday. And when I talk about it, it's not the 56-year-old woman that's talking about it. I can feel the six-year-old come up with her memory And my 56-year-old self has to sit and converse with the six-year-old self and say, there's a reason, there's a reason dad was changed. There's a reason why everything changed. In some cases, just a little. In some cases, a whole lot. Understanding that the six-year-old is the one that's still holding on to why, how come, Didn't he love me enough? Didn't he love mom enough? Didn't mom love dad enough? All of those questions are held by my six-year-old. And at 56, having an adult conversation with that inner child is a great good thing. Sometimes we need help with that. Sometimes when we get to this age and we are sitting with our parent or being aware that our parent is passing, we tend to sit and look at memories the time when things change, when the tide turned. Sometimes we need help in processing that outside of. And so this morning on my Exploring Sacred uh, page on Facebook and also on the Temple Within Radio Network, I posted uh, the SAMHSA hotline and also link in case you need to talk to somebody. Maybe there isn't anybody in your family who wants to talk about it. They just say, oh, that was then, this is now, we need to move forward. Well, sometimes we can't move forward until we take a look backward and we heal that. We come to an understanding, at the very least, with that. And today, before I go any further, I want to give a shout out to a, an amazing group of people here in Michigan, in Big Rapids, Michigan. The Michigan Honor Flight is taking off today. What is the Michigan Honor Flight? The Michigan Honor Flight is a group of volunteers that each year fly veterans from Big Rapids, Michigan to Washington, D.C., to the nation's capital to visit war memorials, to go to the nation's capital. Perhaps they've never been there, to the capital of the, of the nation that they defended, 
that they gave their life for, their life work for, their soul's avocation for. And so, so today, Big Rapids, Michigan, that flight is taking off. I give a salute to everybody, including my cousin Danielle, King Cootie, out there in Georgia, everyone who works at the Veterans Administration and VA hospitals around this country. And everyone who loves a veteran, whether they are combat veterans or not. There's something in that whole warrior, that whole warrior psyche, right? In Native America, those societies are also very alive and well. The Dog Soldier Society, the Kit Fox Society, I've seen them in action. During my time spent up in Montana on the reservation there in Lame Deer, the Kit Fox Society. They may go by different names. Perhaps they're not all going to be called the Dog Soldier Society, but those of you that are Native American and listening, you know what I'm talking about, taking care of the women and the elderlies and the children, those in need. Perhaps one of the conversations that we don't like to have is mental health conversation. Mental health conversation is something that we all need to talk about because the suicide rate for combat veterans in the United States is inexhaustible. It is mind-boggling to me. Part of the reason for having this conversation is so that we can all have conversation. And if you know somebody in the United States, or maybe you're listening now from another country and you know that you've got a family uh, member or a friend or an acquaintance that is part of a military family. Have conversation. Hey, how are you doing? How are you feeling? I understand that your granddaughter was just sent off. Your grandson was just sent off. How are you doing? How are their parents doing? Oh, I understand that your grandson, I understand that your, your daughter just came back. How is she doing? How's she feeling? How's their family doing? Sometimes the conversations that we don't want to have are the ones that bring up our own fears and our own emotions. Sometimes it's ancestral trauma that comes up when we see a veteran who is now without a leg or an arm or part of their face. There's a fear. Conversation does a great thing when it comes to fear. It brings, in my estimation, if it's a good, healthy conversation, it brings understanding, which brings healing. How many times I've heard somebody say, you know, before my, I've, before my father went off to the Korean War, or before my father went off to Afghanistan or Iraq or... Vietnam or many other places. He never drank until he came back. He was never an angry person until he came back. She was never an angry person. She was never a withdrawn person until she came back. That's when things at our house got really, really weird. They became strained. And no one wanted to talk about it. Unfortunately, for many people, mental health discussion is off the table. And oftentimes, particularly in family, warrior families. I don't believe that any of us in this human journey were meant to come here and to see the horrors of war. I'm not saying that war doesn't happen. There are reasons for war. Some are understandable, others we can't wrap our brains around. But war happens. However, the human psyche and the human soul and spirit, I don't believe, is prepared. And I don't care how good you are at Warcraft or Minecraft or any of those war games that our children are now addicted to. Seeing it in real life and playing it on a screen are completely different things. Completely different things. And maybe... You're in a family where you're the only one who's ready to have the discussion or have the talk 
Well, then take the phone number that I provided. In fact, I'm going to say it right out loud here. So let me let me have a little minute here to find that on Facebook. Okay, here we are. The U.S. Department of Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration. <clears throat> Their number is 1-800-662-4357. One eight hundred six six two four three five seven. That's the national helpline. <clears throat> the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline at the same organization. And both of these, they are free, they are confidential, and twenty four seven. So there is no cost to make this phone call. Everybody, the Suicide Prevention Lifeline one eight hundred two seven three eight. Two five five one eight hundred two seven three eight two five five. There's something that happens when we come to these days that we recognize our veterans that are currently serving, those that have passed on. Is that even taking the fly flowers out to the cemetery, replacing a flag? at the cemetery can bring up some emotions, some strong emotions. Maybe we don't want to talk to our relatives about it. Maybe we're angry. Maybe we're angry that our mom and our dad or our mom or our dad came back from war that we don't understand as children or young adults and they were stolen from us. Their joy was stolen from us. Maybe we're angry. Maybe their life was stolen from us. Maybe their sobriety was stolen from us. And chin up sometimes in warrior families is the motto. Chin up. We're not going to talk about that. My father very rarely talked about Vietnam, his time in Vietnam. Very rarely. Once in a very rare blue moon would the Sarge talk about it. And he just said to me one time, Denise Lynn... There are things that I saw and things that happened that I never want to share with you because I don't want those images in your mind, in your heart. As an adult woman, I can understand that. As a kid, I was frustrated by that. Dad, tell me what you saw. What went on, Dad? What went on? This winter... Just before spring, many of you who know me know that for the first time I met my biological father's family. It was one of those days that I really didn't ever think would happen, except that it was my two dads that came to me in a dream some seven or eight years ago, both of them, the Sarge and Billy King, working together side by side in the dreamscape, both dressed in their army greens, to tell me that the, the day would be coming that the day would be coming. And it did. And one of the most emotional parts of the trip for me was going to the cemetery. And not only seeing my father's grave, but his brother's right alongside him. My cousins helped me buy a brand new flag to put there in the flowers. Todd, my husband, sang a beautiful honoring song, very low, very quiet. Sang an honoring song in the Lakota language, the songs that I use inside my ceremonial Inipi sweat lodge. And since that time, I've come home and in preparation for this show, I dug into the archives of my stuff, my military child stuff. And one of the things that I came across yesterday was my U.S. Army dependent dog tag. All of us kids, we had those. Me and my brother Don, we each had one. And on one side of the dog tag, it has our name, U.S. Army dependent, the name of our father, our birth date, and on the back, because we were raised Catholic, it's a St. Christopher medal. And it says, in case of an emergency, 
Oh, in case of an accident, notify a priest. See, 56 years and even my eyesight is not the same. In case of an accident, notify a priest. And we wore these every day. Every day. A couple of years ago when my dad, the Sarge, passed, I made a journey with Todd to Fort Gordon, Georgia. He took me to Fort Gordon. That is where I lived after my adoptive parents adopted me. Fort Gordon, Georgia was an astounding moment for me. We rolled up to the visitor window. You know, one of the MPs came out and asked me why I was there. And I told him. I told him, I said, my father was a career military man. And when he adopted me, this is the home he brought me to, Fort Gordon, Georgia. My earliest memories, those memories that I still have, are here. And without hesitation, he said, you are always welcome here. Welcome home, he said. Welcome home. And I drove up to the visitor center and I got my day pass. But what ended up happening was this lovely young man, soldier, old enough to be my son, looked at me and he did my background check and all those things that they do to make sure that you're okay to be on a military base. And he looked at me and he said, not only do you have a day pass here, you are free to come here for the next year. You can come here anytime in the next year. I still have that year long pass. And the purpose for having that trip to Fort Gordon was so that I could see my history through the eyes of an, of an adult woman, not the child, not the young adult, but as an adult woman to see my father's experience through my now eyes, my current eyes, to see my experience. There was a beautiful moment, for those of you that have been to my home here in Michigan, you know that I have a stand of pines. And I, I say to my uh, friend, Bev Borman, who was our realtor, when we drove up and I saw those pines, I said, I don't care if there's a teepee here or a tent. I want to buy this home for those pines. Well, we drove back by the old housing and the building that my dad used to work in there at Fort Gordon, Georgia, <clears throat> near Augusta. And Todd said to me, well, honey, I guess now we understand where you get your love of that stand of pines. And right down, right alongside the building where he used to work in 1964 and 65 was this magnificent stand of Georgia pines identical to the pines that are in my back enchanted forest the 10 acres of forest a childhood memory that carried forward that a grown woman then understood oftentimes when we're preparing to pass on, particularly, I believe, for a warrior from any time, from any age, whether it, we're talking about Ragnar Lothbrook in the series, right, the History Channel series Vikings. As the warrior prepares either to go to Valhalla or heaven, summer land, whatever we call that, there's a review. There's a review that the warrior has. And in that review, there is a review that the family has, a review of, of life, of war, of changes, of joy, jubilation, passion, sadness, addiction. That's keeping it real. All of it. You know, human life is messy. It really is. This journey that we've all decided to take, 
Ooh, it's messy. And messes come in different ways, shapes, and forms. And by messy, I mean complicated, sometimes ugly, sometimes frightening. And that review or that approach to review. All I'm saying is that for those of you that are young adults or adults of young children, have conversations with them. If you see that they're needing help because mom or dad didn't come back, quite the same. You cannot come back from any situation ever the same. When we become a parent, we are never the same. When we become a grandparent, we are never the same. When we have an illness, we are never the same. There are situations in our lives that render us not the same. They're growth points. And sometimes the growth feels catastrophic. Sometimes the growth is stunted. And I don't believe we do anything in a vacuum. And that includes when we go through these changes as adults, how it affects those that we love, no matter what their age, have a conversation. If you see that help is needed, reach out. Contact the local VA hospital in your area. I know a lot of people have a lot of opinions about things. I happen to believe that everybody is doing the best that they can for the most part. Give the VA hospital a call in your area. Ask them. If not for yourself, for your children, for your grandchildren. For your spouse, for your friend, for yourself, reach out. Reach out. And as the years go by, continue to help them understand. As an adult, I still to this day, you know, when I see the Blue Angels, anything having to do with the Blue Angels, or if I'm at an event, where the Blue Angels are present. I remember a few years back when Gerald Ford passed on. And of course, I live in his hometown of Grand Rapids, Michigan. And I remember the day coming home from the newspaper, seeing the Blue Angels flying above the highway. And of course, that one lone airplane peeling away, as they say, representing him. Peeling away. going free. I guess those are those things that a lot of people who grow up in military families or are members of the military, we not only see the power and the might and we hear it roaring and rumbling above, but we understand the peeling away. The tomb of the unknown soldier. We look at those POW, MIA black flags hanging on poles, and perhaps there's a personal meaning. Maybe our parent or grandparent did come back, but there's a part of them that's still a prisoner of war or missing in action. This Memorial Day, maybe, maybe you'll make a call to find out how somebody is. Maybe you'll make a donation to a charity that helps wounded veterans, whether they're mentally, emotionally wounded or spiritually and physically wounded. Maybe you'll say a prayer for them and their families. Maybe you'll do something fun with the children whose parents are currently at war. Maybe give relief to the spouse who's left behind on top of going to the cemetery and leaving flowers. Maybe we can put that sentiment into action. Put our love into action. Just like our servicemen and women have done for ages, they put their love into action, their courage into action. What they believe in, what they feel, what they're passionate about, into action. 
now's a time for us. It's a beautiful opportunity for us to do the same, not only on behalf of them, but on behalf of those that they love. With that, everybody, have a beautiful day. Get out there and shine your light as only you can shine it. Blessings be.